when we meditate, we're trying to establish a good relationship between the mind and the breath. A relationship of harmony, trust, one where both sides benefit. In that way, it's very much like establishing a relationship with another person. And it's useful to think about what the Buddha has to say about developing good relations with another person and see how we can apply it to the, the issue of being on good terms with the breath. One of the blessings that we chant in the morning, dhanan chabaya wa chan cha. This is from a sutta where the Buddha talks about how a family gets together or can stay together, how people can stay together on good terms. And he lists basically four qualities. Generosity, kind words, genuine helpfulness, and consistency. And those are precisely the things we need in the meditation. To begin with, when you meditate, you have to give of yourself. All too many people come to meditation thinking, well, what can I get out of this? Without remembering that the good things in life can come only when you're willing to give. You have to give your time. You have to give your energy. You have to put a lot of thought and attention into what you're doing. You can't just be taking all the time. And this also means making sacrifices. You have to sacrifice the time that you could, could have been devoting to something else. And as you're focusing on the breath, learning how to meditate, you have to make some other sacrifices in life as well. It's the same as when you're having a relationship with another person. You have to give up some aspects of your relationships with other people. And here it's the same with the breath. You really want to get to know the breath, you have to give up your infatuation with sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, and ideas. All those people you like to hang around with all the time. You've got to hang around with the breath. In the beginning, the breath may seem very boring. There's not much there. There's in and out. At least that's what it seems when you start out. But as you devote more and more time to the breath, you realize that there's a lot more going on here. There's a whole issue of breath energy in the body and how that relates to the other properties, the water property, the earth property, the fire property in the body. It takes a lot of time. You have to be very observant to get to know the breath. These are all things you have to give to the meditation, in the same way that you have to give to a relationship to a person outside. Because it's only when you have that attitude of being generous will the relationship thrive. In a sense, the mind has to be generous with itself, too, because you have to remember, okay, it's going to take time. The mind has a lot of old habits that are going to take time to be reworked, be redirected. And so you can't let yourself get too frustrated over the mind's recalcitrance. You have to give it some space as well. This is where the kind words come in. You learn how to encourage yourself, especially when things get difficult or when things seem to be long. You kind of give yourself words of encouragement to keep your morale up. This doesn't mean, of course, that you have to be a Pollyanna, blind to the problems in the mind. But when there are problems in the mind, again, you learn how to speak to the mind in a way that's encouraging. That really gives you the energy to practice. Now, this is up to you in your own psychology, what works, what kind of encouragement works, and what kind of encouragement makes you lazy. 
that you have to work out. And even when there are times when you have to point out to the mind a lot of its really unskillful habits, you find that it works best when the mind is basically in a good mood. And this is one of the reasons why we practice concentration to begin with. The mind is a lot more likely to admit to its defilements and the fact that they are defilements when it has a sense of well-being. That's not just one more case of your dumping on yourself. So in the same way that when if you have something harsh to say to somebody else or something critical to say, you try to find the right time, the right place, show them some respect, even though you're being critical. Try to get them in as good and receptive a mood as possible. Because even though the, the criticisms may be harsh, the fact that you're showing them some respect, that makes the words kind. They go down a lot more easily. So that's the same with the mind. When things are difficult in the meditation, don't let yourself get frustrated. Don't start yelling at yourself. Find ways to encourage yourself. And if you're going to be critical, be critical of yourself in a supportive way. Being genuinely, genuinely helpful, that's another way that keeps a genera uh, <coughs> excuse me, gets a, keeps a relationship going, and it keeps your relationship with the breath going. You really explore what the body needs in terms of breath energy. This is one of those areas where you have to really study things. What does the body actually need? We go into the breathing with a lot of preconceived notions about what the breath does and how it moves and where it goes. And you're going to have to learn some things anew to see what really is useful for the breath and what really is useful for the mind. And this requires a lot of exploration, a lot of observation on your part. Some people find that they have an instinctive like for the in-breath as opposed to the out-breath. That's funny, but it happens. Or it might be the other way around. Some people prefer the out-breath to the in-breath. If you find that happening, you're also going to find that you're doing some damage to your health. Sometimes you have a tendency to squeeze the breath at the end to sort of demarcate the in-breath from the out-breath so we can be very clearly aware of where one begins and the other ends. That can have a bad effect on the body, too. It's better to think of the breath as one continuous property. Well, the line between the in-breath and the out-breath can be blurred. You don't want to force any artificial clarity on it by squeezing it or pulling it out. That's just one issue that might come up. In other words, in order to find out what's genuinely helpful, you have to really pay attention to what the breath needs, to what the body needs, to what the mind needs as well. Because sometimes a certain breath, type of breathing may feel good for the body, but the mind has trouble staying with it, in which case you've got to change. Then there are times when there's a kind of breathing that may feel good, especially the very gentle, subtle breathing may feel good. But the body's getting starved of oxygen. I found years ago when I was suffering from migraines that really deep, long in breaths, almost to the point of well, to the point of discomfort as you suck the breath in, suck the breath in, really did help with the migraines. It just means you have to learn how to study what's actually beneficial. Because sometimes the easy, smooth path is not the beneficial path. That's a point to keep in mind. That fourth quality, what it calls consistency, basically comes down to commitment. You're really going to stick it out. You're here for the long term. That means that you have to develop the virtues of being long term, determination, patience, equanimity, truthfulness. Once you make it up your mind you're going to do something, you really do it. That's what truthfulness means. It's not just telling the truth, but it also means being true to the decisions you've made, 
the determinations you've made. That's yes, with patience, and it's the same with contentment. You have to figure out what are the things you're going to be patient with and what are the things you're not. Basically what it comes down to, if there's something that's beyond your control, you have to learn to develop patience and tolerance. As for unskillful thoughts coming up in the mind, the Buddha says, don't tolerate them. Don't be patient with them. Try to undercut them. Try to remove them to the mind if you can, with the same sense of urgency as if your head were on fire. It's a parallel with contentment. You learn to content yourself with what you've got in terms of material things. But as the Buddha said, you never let yourself rest content with whatever level of skill you have, as long as there's more work to be done. Similarly with equanimity. We need equanimity in order to deal with difficult situations. But you don't want to be equanimous about just everything that comes along. You know, the mind isn't getting concentrated, well, I'll be equanimous about it. Greed has moved in, well, I'll be equanimous about it. Well, that doesn't work. When things outside aren't going well, Buddha says don't try to replace them with more pleasant things outside. He says remind yourself that the real work, the real problem is inside. He says replace what he calls householder grief with renunciate grief. In other words, when the situation outside is, is bad, you remind yourself, well, the real problem is not the situation outside. It's the fact that you still have work to be done inside. So that's the case where you just can't be equanimous about everything. This doesn't mean that when situations aren't going well outside that the other person may not be at fault. But the question is, do you want to suffer? If you don't want to suffer, you've got to turn around and look at what you're doing that's unskillful. We're not here to sort out who's right and who's wrong. There is no last judgment in Buddhism, because there's no beginning point in time. How could you ever keep score or keep a tally when, as the Buddha says, you can't find a beginning point? It makes sense to keep tally only when there is a beginning point. You say, okay, since X time, the beginning the beginning point, this person did wrong X number of times, that person did wrong Y number of times, because you have a, a line where the comparisons begin. But here we don't have that. So it's not a question of deciding who's right and who's wrong. The question is, do you want to suffer or not? And the same situation applies inside as well. When things aren't going well, you can't just simply be equanimous about it. You've got to ask yourself, well, what's going wrong here? What's the mistake? What's the problem that I haven't understood yet? And work on that. This is how you stay committed to your relationship with the breath. And then you're going to find out there are things you have to give up and other things you have to do. Things that you really like that you have to give up, and things you don't want to do that you have to do. And this is where discernment comes in and enables you to stay with your commitment here to the breath. For example, it's very easy when the mind gets concentrated to say, well, it's after a while it's enough concentration, now I can move on to something else. But you have to remember, you need this skill in all sorts of situations. This is where the recollection of death comes in. That's something very useful. If you stay concentrated only as long as you need for getting a sense of refreshment and then you just let it go and wander off to something else, you're not going to develop the power of concentration you're going to need that's going to be able to withstand pain, withstand illness, withstand all the other difficulties that come as you get older, as you get sick, as you approach death. Which means that when you're sitting here and you've developed a strong enough sense of well-being, you don't just let go and sort of wander off. You've either got to stay in concentration or you've got to figure out, well, what can I do that's going to give rise to more insight here? What issues do I still have? 
In other words, it's a task to be done here. We're not just here for a sense of well-being in the present moment. We practice this for more mindfulness and alertness. We practice this for more discernment. We practice this in order to keep, keep improving, strengthening the mind, giving the mind more power so that it can maintain its concentration not only when the situation is relatively ideal, as it is right now, everything's quiet, supportive. But even when things are difficult, you want to be able to maintain that same sense of purpose, that same sense of focus. So there's work to be done. We're not here just for the, the pleasure of the concentration. It's because the concentration gives us a framework, a foundation, where we can do really serious work on the mind. This is why we have to be committed to the concentration. So whatever ingenuity you can develop in order to remind yourself of why you may be wanting, may you, you may should have to do things that you may not want to do at the moment, or why you have to give up things that you would like to do, that ingenuity is an aspect of discernment and an important one. We're not here just to learn about emptiness or not-self or more abstract teachings. We're here to figure out, well, why does the mind keep creating suffering for itself, and how can we train it so that it doesn't? How can we get past our unskillful habits? That requires commitment. So think of this as a long-term relationship, one where you have to give. You're going to gain a lot from it, but you also have to give in order to get that level of happiness, that level of peace, the level of well-being that you want. It requires that you be attentive that you know how to encourage the mind to keep it on track. So that you and the breath become fast friends. And that from now until the time when you breathe your last breath, you'll be helpful to each other. Because ultimately, there. You have to let go of the breath, but you want to do it on good terms. Same with, with any relationship. There comes a point where the relationship has to end, but you want to make sure that both sides have benefited. And when there hasn't been this sense of commitment and truthfulness, And when the relationship ends, there's no regret. 